Hi, Captain Steve for BoatTest.com, and today I'm on the Fleming 78. A lot to go through on this boat, so let's start with the operational features. We'll begin right here at the Flybridge helm. The upper panel has two 24-inch touch screens, flanking a boning screen. There are two Furuno multifunction displays. The compass is in line with the steering wheel. The lower panel from left to right begins with the engine controls, the thruster controls, and the joystick. Then there's a stabilizer control panel, two windlass controls, the autopilot, spotlight control, and then the VHF. Steering wheel is vertically mounted in all stainless steel. There's a double wide helm seat by Stid, fully adjustable. All the way over to the starboard side is another set of controls, this time without the joystick. All the way aft, there's another control station, and then the boat deck that's large enough to hold the rib, launched by the crane right alongside. Taking a look at the lower helm, starts with a TV, microphone for the first VHF, two 32 inch touchpad controls. To the starboard side of the helm panel is the inverter control, the water maker control, and climate control. Below, boning display, and there's so much information coming through this that it could be its own video. In fact, it is, so you can check that out on boattest.com as well. Control head display for the sticks right alongside. Then there's the thruster controls and joystick. 24 inch stainless steel wheel up above. First VHF, standalone GPS, two multifunction displays, AIS, then the second VHF. Underneath, one, two, three access panels. And I really like that everyone's phone number is listed right there along with the air and water draft. Fleming stands behind what it sells so you can get a phone call to anything you need. Visibility is through three large windshields, 58 by 34 inches. One thing that's important for a cruising yacht to have is redundancy. And on the Fleming 78, there's a boatload of it. First of all, five control stations, all of which have the sticks and the thruster controls. Two of them, the one right here in the pilot house and on the port side of the flying bridge helm have joystick functionality. This is activated by simply pressing twice. Now we've got controllability with the joystick. If we press and hold for five seconds, light comes on, screen verifies that we now have position keeping. If you want to get out of that quickly, just give the joystick a hit. And if we want to take control of the sticks again, just a double press and now we're back in control here. Now, if the controls go dead for whatever reason, then we can simply go to backup and everything gets rooted through this one control head, but differently to the control stations down in the engine room. Get out of that. We have steering backup as well. Flip that, and now we can control our steering from this toggle switch. If that doesn't work, we also have the autopilot. So triple redundancy for the steering. Below into the port hand side, remote battery switches, ignitions, generator controls, 24 volt DC buses. To the starboard side is the AC panel. Helm seat, double wide at four feet, has a fixed center armrest, both armrests on the outsides flip up. There are flip footrests. This adjusts fore and aft and reclines. Chart table over to the port hand side. Always happy to see when someone still utilizes paper charts. They won't die when the electricity fails. Chart light just above, storage underneath. And then just behind, L-shaped settee. It's on an elevated platform, and I would easily use this as a berth for the off watch. To the aft end of the raised pilot house are stairs leading up to the flying bridge, all satin finished. Now it's important to note that we can also get a door here to keep the pilot house private and block off any light pollution if we're operating at night. Now there's a separate mechanical room located just forward. Let's take a look. All of your water pumps are in the back. Gray water pumps, black water pumps, two hot water heaters. There's an AC box there and another one right at the entrance controlling the conversion for electricity and the frequency to make sure you have clean electricity anywhere in the world. To the starboard side, obviously all the air conditioning compressors. Under a large hatch, all of the house batteries and then just in front, remote battery switches. Over to the port hand side are the primary and secondary inverters and then fully forward, the bow thruster and the expansion tank for the heads. Crew quarters are accessed from the port side deck. Let's start with the first crew cabin. 
This looks to me to be a captain's cabin. It's got the boning control panel in front and just above a TV. It's got a twin berth, opening port light, and plenty of storage. There's also a door here leading to the next cabin, or we can step out and access the same cabin from here. This one has a smaller berth, so this will be the crew cabin, also with an opening port light and plenty of storage. And then back out, the crew head. And this is a wet head. Now, just in front, access to the engine room. Let's take a look. Well, this is clearly a nicely laid out engine room. Focal point being the twin MAN B12 1550 horsepower engines. Minimum space between them right at the fuel filters, 27 inches. Headroom right at the entrance, five feet, nine inches, and it increases to six feet, five inches because the deck slopes down. Nice workspace with storage underneath. 29 kW generator, the first of two. The exhaust system is well supported and there's air and water separators to keep you quiet and as a good neighbor at the anchorage. Looking straight down, aqua drive shaft seal. That takes all the vibration and noise out of the engine and keeps it quiet throughout the boat. Power takeoff. This is nice. The fuel management system and it's very easy to read. You simply turn the valve to whichever way you want to come from and go to. And it's very nicely labeled. And the tanks are just ahead. Sight tubes, one, two, three, and four. To both sides, stabilizer fins are easily accessible. And notice looking to the outboard sides of the engine, mirror on the other side so we can see for that side without having to make our way over there. Much the same ingredients over to this starboard side with the exception of the water maker. 1,800 gallon per day for raw water, 1,500 gallons a day for fresh water. Membranes are easily accessible as well. It's a hot water heater for the crew quarters just behind us. Another 29 kW generator. I like that the two generators aren't coming on automatically. I want control of that myself. So manual switching for both of them, put on whichever one you want. The high point here is you only need one at a time to run all of the systems on the boat. Air conditioning, dishwasher, washer, dryer, all of it. Right behind this engine, another power takeoff. So we can control the hydraulics with either engine. And behind to the starboard side, Another set of batteries, one for the generator, one for the engine, and these are start batteries. Air conditioning system for the crew quarters, and then the hydraulic system. The hydraulics will cover the stabilizers, the thrusters, and the windlasses. The water is brought in from the water maker, cleaned, filtered, it's pure fresh water, but then it goes through a UV purifier so it gets even cleaner than that. There's literally nothing that's gonna grow in these water lines. Now let's take a look in the lazarette. First of all, the hatch is electrically actuated and what a hunk of hatch it is. I mean, that is welded stainless steel. Inside the compartment, clear access to the steering gear. The two sides are connected by a tie bar. There's a hydraulic components for the stern thruster. Glendening cord reels, 50 amp on one side, 100 amp on the other, and fully forward, the water tank. To both quarters, large 14 inch cleats and notice that the forward one is recessed so we aren't in the knee strike zone large hawse holes with heavy duty rollers. There's a warping winch. And look at the size of this deck drain. No problem with shipping water on this deck. Of course, all of this is repeated to the opposite side. Fire pulls are to the port side. Open decks surround the entire boat as we make our way forward 36 inches to the bulwarks height. The cap rails are 10 and a half inches. And believe it or not, these are synthetic material called burwood. We can also get teak and have it left natural or bleached and varnished. Width to the side deck is 19 inches. There's protection overhead 7 feet 10 inches off the deck and it comes out 24 inches. Below are large cleats and large hawse holes with stainless steel rollers. At this point, the bulwarks come up 31 inches. There's a side boarding gate with a minimum width of 17 inches. There's another set of cleats to both sides of a hawse hole, giving us two midship cleats. We go up four steps with the third step concealing the forward fuel tank fills. At the top of the stairs, there's another side boarding gate, which brings us then to the Portuguese bridge. There are storage compartments in the forward section of the bulwarks. To both port and starboard, there are gates leading us to the bow, and these gates are held on with heavy duty hinges and are held open with gas assist struts. And there are dual sets of cleats and hawse holes. The ground tackle is on an elevated platform 15 inches off the deck. Two Maxwell windlasses lead out to a pair of pulpit mounted ultra anchors, the smaller being 60 kilograms, the larger 80 kilograms. 
A hatch to starboard has storage, the remote control plug for the windlass, and a 50 amp smart plug connection. The hatch to port conceals the fresh and raw water washdown. The road locker is just behind and is compartmentalized, separating the dual all chain roads. The Fleming 78 has a length overall of 81 feet 6 inches, a beam of 21 feet 5 inches, and a draft of 5 feet. With a test weight of 188,000 pounds and the twin man 1550 engines wound up to 2300 RPM, our speed topped out at 21.3 knots. Rather inconsequential as no one would run her at that speed, but the point is, you could. So let's get to where you would run her. There are typically two speeds for passage making in this yacht, one at 11 knots at 1250 RPM, which produced a 27 gallon per hour fuel burn and an 1102 nautical mile range. The second is more transoceanic at 1,000 RPM and 8.7 knots, giving 13 gallons per hour and just over 1,800 nautical mile range. Now, because long-range displacement cruisers have different objectives than planing boats, they must be much more precise with fuel management, since a small disparity in GPH calculations can mean the difference between reaching a destination or not. For that reason, when testing the Fleming 78, we also recorded vital performance numbers in half-knot increments rather than at RPM settings and the critical displacement speeds. For example, at 8 knots the range was 2922.1 nautical miles. At 7.5 knots it was just over 3487 nautical miles and at 7 knots we could keep going for just over 3975 nautical miles. So again, small changes make big differences. Be sure to look for the full half knot increment chart in the written report section on the BoatTest.com model page for this yacht. So for a boat that weighs almost 200,000 pounds, she is so easily maneuvered, it's incredible to feel. Got to be huge props and rudders because even just a nudge into gear gets her responding, but because of her weight, she's not going to lurch ahead. So it's comfortable control, but not uncomfortable in close quarters. There's enough thrust to get the boat moving, but it's not going to shove you to one side. Nice balance of horsepower and controllability there, and they're progressive thrusters. So coming out of that tight spot that we were in, we were able to just nudge it back and forth as we made our way out and kept it centered in that little fairway. The responsiveness to the helm doesn't end right at the dock. It also continues when we're offshore. Just under uh, top speed, put the wheel hard over. She'll come around 180 degrees in 25 seconds, and she'll do it in roughly two boat lengths. So. She's so maneuverable. It's such an easy boat to drive. Really like the maneuverability with the wheel. It's just a nice feather touch. Clearly, there's an awful lot to like about this boat from both an owner operator standpoint or if you have crew aboard. She's also comfortable to be on and entertain with, but that's another video. Be sure to look for it. For now, this is my full performance evaluation and sea trial of the Fleming 78. For BoatTest.com, I'm Captain Steve. We'll see you on the water.